you for sharing your time with us this afternoon in our broiler breeder and layer session. Before we start, I would like to introduce myself. I will be your moderator for this afternoon session. My name is Dr. Karen Olan. I'm a PCPP Diplomate and currently I am San Miguel Foods Inc. Area Operations Manager for Broiler Breeder Operations in Southeast Luzon. So having said that, I know you already have an idea in mind how excited I am for this afternoon session. So I hope you're feeling the same way too because we have five amazing speakers uh, for this afternoon. And the, before we begin, before we start with our uh, first paper, um, just a little housekeeping. If you have questions in mind during the presentation, please type them in on the Q&A box on your Zoom control panel because after the five presentations, we will be having the open forum. And also, don't forget to take the quiz and answer uh, the evaluation form. Our broiler session is also happening right now, so if you want to check that out, you can just uh, click and go to the other breakout room. So too much for the introduction, let's start with our first paper. Our first paper to be presented for this afternoon's layer and broiler breeder breakout session is identifying factors affecting point of lay in broiler breeder parent stock consequential to the more efficient broiler breeders and broilers. Our first speaker earned his Bachelor of Science in Veterinary Medicine and Animal Husbandry at Central Luzon State University, City of Munoz, Nueva Ecija. He worked at PANC as R&D for poultry, worked as CG Technical Officer at CPFP, and at Viterich Corporation as Technical Veterinarian and Sales for Poultry. Currently, he is the Technical Service Manager for Cobb Ventures Philippines. He specialized in poultry management and health for broilers and broiler breeders. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. John Lemuel V. De La Cruz. So good day everyone. I'm Dr. Lemuel De La Cruz, one of the Technical Service Managers of Cobb Ventures Philippines Inc. And today I would like to share the factors affecting the point of lay and how it affects broiler breeder and broiler performances. So in this presentation, we will be able to answer these few questions. First, what are the factors affecting point of lay? Second, what is the economic importance of a weak delay on point of lay? So there are three main coexisting factors affecting point of lay assuming we don't have problems during dark out rain. First is genetics, second is environment, and third is management. And under these are some sub factors that will be discussed later on. So today's modern breeder chickens are more efficient, more productive, and more robust. This progress is due to improved genetics and advances in husbandry methods. For us to improve genetics, we need to undergo through four processes of selecting desired traits. First is phenotypic selection. Second is muscle and carcass ultrasonography. Third is feed conversion. And fourth is exiscopy. In phenotypic selection, we naturally select from pedigrees with desired traits. Genetic merit is identified through DNA analysis to precisely identify the healthiest and best pure line of chickens. For females, we need them to lay more quality hatching eggs as early as possible. Good fleshing and fat deposition. For males, we need them to have good fleshing to have better fertility thus improving hatchability. We also need them to be vigorous with high libido, but not too much aggressive. Second is muscle carcass ultrasonography. This is used to assess meat and muscle conversion. And toughness and smoothness of muscle texture decide, desired for food consumption. Third is feed conversion. This is one of the top criteria we are looking for broilers, as well as broiler breeders, 
in terms of feed consumption per egg produced. Fourth and last is lixiscopy. Lixiscopy. This is a non-invasive assessment of bone integrity and legs, which is very important for male breeders for mounting the females and for broilers decreasing condemnation due to splayed legs. To fully express the potential of our parent stock, before we stimulate them to lay, we need to know these three pieces of information from our genetic companies. First is fleshing requirement. Flesh will be used for the production of our eggs during the first stage of laying. Having lower fleshing before photo stimulation could also indicate less fat deposition, reproductive development, because our bodies and theirs are programmed to prioritize survival. Second is body weight, which is also correlated with fleshing. We usually light our flocks whenever they have reached 2,480 grams to 2,520 grams by the way. We usually light our flocks whenever they have reached 2,480 grams to 2,520 grams by the weight for cub 500 PS fast feather female at 21 weeks of age. Third is fat deposition. 80 to 90% of flax should have fat deposits, for this will be used for persistency of egg production going through post peak. Depletion of this were usually due to malnutrition or stress, which will also relate to an abrupt decrease in production. Now for the second factor, environment. This could be divided into two sub-factors. First is nutrition and second is thermal comfort. For nutrition is one of the most important factors that directly affect production. For nutrition, for nutrition is one of the most important factors that directly, directly affect production giving lesser or higher specs of feed than recommended by genetic companies could result in decreased egg production and ovarian regression. Second is thermal comfort. High temperature will cause panting. This will result into use of energy and other nutrients during respiratory alkalosis. Low temperature will cause flocks to be lethargic, results to lesser water intake, and will use energy for heat production. Under thermal stress, instead of energy to be used for reproductive organ development, fat deposition, and production, it would go instead to heat increment or maintenance. Now for the third and final main factor management. To attain both genetic potential and consistent flock production, the flock manager must have good management program. Management must meet the basic needs of the flock, but also adjust the program to benefit fully from the breed's potential. Some of the guidelines may need to be adopted locally according to your experience or infrastructure. Management affects the breeder's performance by 70 to 80 percent and there are so, uh, and there are five sub factors under management now for the first sub factor lighting management chickens are photoperiodic and response to long photo periods by activation of reproductive axis they are stimulated for they are stimulated reproductively by the duration of light hours and intensity. This will induce production of hormones for follicle development, maturation, and laying. These hormones came from fats. Without enough fats, kickstart and persistency will be an issue. Having broiler breeders 
start earliest as possible will have an incremental effect in lowering cost. But to start laying below 20 weeks, this will result in early production of eggs but at a small size, which will be disadvantageous to the broilers having lower initial value. This will also result to high broken eggs and lower egg mass. Now for the second sub-factor, there are four objectives in feed and water management. First is to develop proper fleshing. Second is to achieve uniform and proper body weights. Third is fat deposition. And fourth is the reproductive organ development. Now, for litter, ventilation, and vaccination, mismanagement of this will cause stress. Therefore, most of the energy will be used for maintenance rather than production. Now, I will show you a sample of computation in a week delay in POM. This will add cost of 24.15 pesos per bird in feeds, 58 cents per bird in labor, 82 cents per bird in electricity, and longer time to achieve desired performance, which sums up to 25.55 pesos per bird, 16 cents per egg, 16.5 cents per hatching egg, and 19 cents per DOC. In a million DOC production, it will be equal to 190,000. In a million, in a million DOC production, it will be equal to 190,000 worth of losses. Now, before I conclude this presentation, I would like to leave two key points. First, is broiler breeders are photo. Before I conclude this presentation, before I end this presentation, I would like to leave you two key points. First, broiler breeders are photoperiodic and they need two things for proper stimulation light exposure and light intensity. Second, dark out rearing will play a big role for light sensitivity for flocks. Thus, it will be easier to induce lay. We should make sure that they achieve. We should make sure that they achieve proper body conformation before photo stimulation, and make them very light sensitive to induce proper laying time, so that we can achieve performance closest to its potential. And thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. De La Cruz. Moving on to our next paper. The second paper to be presented for this afternoon's layer and broiler breeder breakout session is the impact of infectious laryngotrachitis to the performance of long-living birds disease review, and modern approaches to diagnosis, prevention, and control. Our second speaker earned her degree as Doctor of Veterinary Medicine at La Salle University, Bogota, Colombia. She also earned her Masteral for Specialized Veterinary Medicine, Avian Medicine at North Carolina College of Veterinary Medicine. She held various positions such as Research Specialist, at the Laboratory of Avian Pathology at the University of Pennsylvania, Poultry Health Management Resident at North Carolina State University, Director at Salisbury Animal Health Laboratory in Maryland Department of Agriculture, and worked as an independent poultry veterinary consultant. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professional Services Veterinarian of Barner Ingelheim Animal Health USA, Dr. Claudia R. Osorio. Thank you for the invitation to be part of this important program. The topic of my presentation is about the impact 
of infectious laryngotracheitis to the performance of long living birth, disease review, and modern approaches to diagnosis, prevention, and control. ILT was first reported in the US in 1925. Although chickens are considered to be the primary target host, natural disease has been reported in pitfalls, pheasants, and turkeys. The disease is found in every area of the world. It is commonly only sporadic in nature. Some areas don't seem to be affected for long periods, then the disease will appear. The family is Herpesviridae and the species are Gallic Herpesvirus 1. The herpes virus is sensitive to heat and various disinfectants. There are reports of inactivation in 50 minutes at 55 Celsius or in 48 hours at 38 Celsius. Chemical disinfectants as, as such as formalin and hypochlorite effectively inactivate ILT on contact. ILT can survive away from the host for several weeks under farm conditions and longer when the environment is cold, especially in the presence of organic material such as mucus, blood, and feces. The virus tends to persist in recovery chickens for variable periods after recovery from the disease. The carrier state presents considerable significance as carriers may check the reactivated virus and may be responsible for outbreaks of the disease. And it is important to remember that like other herpes viruses, ILT undergoes latency in the trigeminal ganglion and gets reactivated whenever the birds undergo stress, leading to increased shedding and environmental spread, which make eradication of ILT very difficult. All ages are susceptible, and although greatest susceptibility occurs in very young, the disease is most commonly seen in the field in birds older than three weeks. The disease may be exacerbated by concurrent infection with a variety of other pathogens, such as Newcastle, infectious bronchitis virus, colpos viruses, and mycoplasma. Excess ammonia in the atmosphere may also predispose birds to more severe disease. It is well established in highly dense poultry producing areas of the world due to the characteristics of latency and carrier status of the virus. Increased incidence of the disease is due to more concrete factors, such as decrease in downtime of production size, poor biosecurity, poor vaccination methods, and as I mentioned before, the increase in poultry production density. Transmission through the egg has never been reported, and newly hatched chicks are free from infection. The virus usually get introduced, let me look here for the pointer. So the virus usually gets introduced into a flock by direct contact with respiratory hexodase or indirect mechanical transmission of contaminated equipment like litter, feed bags, feathers, vehicles, dust, footwear, clothes, and movement of people. Infected bears go with the respiratory secretions for around 10 days post-infection. The disease spreads then from bear to bear more rapidly than in comparison to contact with carrier bears. When recovered chickens and vaccinated chickens become carriers, they will shed virus for long periods of time or much later can shed virus following stress induce reactivation of latent infections, thus exposing other susceptible birds. Mixing vaccinated chickens with naive 
is important with respect to direct transmission. Some recent studies demonstrated that ILT can persist in the biofield of drinking water lines and spread to susceptible bears. Darkling beetles and mealworms also act as a source of infection to the bears, and the live virus has been demonstrated in darkling beetles even 42 days after the disease outbreak. Dogs and cats retrieving dead bear carcasses from affected poultry houses also spread the infection. Windborne transmission of ILT has been demonstrated between commercial operations. Bayer chickens are a potential source of ILT virus. Improper manure and dead bear disposal are also contributed to the infection. Now we are going to talk about economic and significance. We have different approaches of the economic significance of ILT. As an example, diseases of poultry say that we can expect to experience multi-million dollar losses each year as a consequence of the ILT. We can see that here on the, on the left, in this screen. Now, on the right one is another example from the OIE. The morbidity and mortality vary depending on the virulence of the strain of the virus. So here is an example, variable mortality, can range from 5 to 70 percent and an average between 10 to 20 percent. Other studies mentioned that in layers, the most important consequences are the increase of mortality and the decrease on air production. Some of them mentioned ranges for mortality between 5 and 16 percent and X production losses from 10 to 74. Also, personal communications from some of the college, they feel that the ILT has an effect in the pullet house failing to reach breeded targets. This is like it due to poor weight gains and uniformity from the effect of the infection in survivors. So, basing these average losses, I create the following examples to understand these economic losses. So here we have uh, as an example of a hen, and then we say, uh, I know different cycles of egg production can have from different breeds, can be 370 eggs. In this case, for this example exercise, we have 300 eggs in a cycle. That is a total of 25,000 for a price or the wholesale price of $1.91. This is um, multiplying this price is $48 total. Now, if we calculate this for 100,000 hens in the house, then we know that there is no 100,000 hens, there is millions of hens in a layered house. But for this purpose of this exercise, we multiply this time 48, that will be a 4.8 million for just one hen. So if we consider an ILT outbreak, we will lose 74 eggs. That will be a total of 226 eggs, the equivalent to 18 dozen. So a $1.91, that it will be a total of $34 times 100,000 hens, will be 30.4 million. So this essentially means here that we are taking a risk of $1.4 million of losses without including the production cost. This is another um, small exercise here, just looking if we lost uh, bullets. So in the case we have 100,000 bullets and, the and we have a mortality of 16%, we will lose 16,000 bullets. That's a total of 84,000. So if, uh, if we multiply this, the price of the bullet, according to this report, $4.48. So if we don't have losses, it will be almost $500. And then here, 
losing 16% of mortality will be $376,000. So it's a, a loss here around $71,680 without including the production cost. So this is only an example, like I said before, with 100,000 bullets, and we know that our uh, bullet houses have almost um, a million hands. For the diagnosis, so the first part of the diagnosis, the indication of the disease is the clinical signs. Those are the ones that often lead to a rapid diagnosis. The clinical course of ILT varies from 11 to 6 weeks depending on the form of the disease. In severe forms of the disease, birds may be found dead without signs or sudden acute dyspnea. Birds cough and have difficulty breathing. The trachea becomes blocked and the birds gasp. After birds often are seen with their head and neck extended outward with the mouth open and a loud whistling sound is heard on inspiration is characteristic of the ILT. So here on the left, we can see a video from, uh, this is from my experience in the laboratory before when we are seeing a bear going through an ILT outbreak. So we have also uh, these pictures here for the um, diseases of poultry in which are describing mild forms of the disease. So we can have conjunctivitis, watery eyes, the eyelids may be closed. We also can have um, tracheitis and sinusitis, and also other cases of low mortality. Here are uh, pictures of the gross lesions, also characteristics of this disease. So we can see when the virus is less pathogenic, we have here uh, congestion on the conjunctiva and the sinus, and then the trachea just have exudates and a little um, red color. But when we look at the pathogenic strains, highly virulent, we can see the mucus, um, hemorrhagic mucus in the trachea, and then also we can see tracheal cast. Like in this case, we can see that this, the trachea is filled with exudate, or in this case, it's also um, has blocked and with the yellow caseosus clot, so the bird cannot um, breathe. So another uh, part of the diagnosis, very important, are the, um, the histopathology. So we can see here the more um, classic gold standard uh, method to diagnose the ILT by histopathology. So are these characteristics uh, multinucleated syncytial cells that we can see here in the trachea. Sometimes, of course, is we have to consider it that if we sample the trachea six days after the infection, so perhaps these intranuclear inclusions may not be visible. So, but it doesn't mean the case is negative. So we just have to try to do the diagnosis uh, the first week uh, when we are seeing the, the symptoms. We also have here virus isolation and identification. So in this case, we will get the exudate scrapings of the trachea, and then we put it in a nutrient broth, and then that will be inoculated in the coroalantoin coro membrane that we call the CAM. And also we can see here on the left, the picture with the inflammation and the circulation, a lot of hemorrhages at, at the same time with the POC lesions that we see here. So uh, after this is um, the results of we, the observations in the, the inoculations in the embryo, so we, we will do histopathology of this membrane, or we can also determine by immunofluorence or any other tools of diagnostics. So we will see here by histopathology, the same, the intranuclear inclusions characteristics of the ILT, as we are seeing here. So other uh, methods of diagnostic, very important, the PCR. Um, we have the real-time PCR, highly sensitive, and is specific to detect the ILT in the tissue. So in the US, these two tools, the histo and the PCR, are very important for the diagnosis. I mean, we can have a PCR results 
in an hour and a half or two, uh, depending on the availability of the laboratory. But with these two, we already start acting on um, some prevention methods or so start to act um, to, to prevent the outbreak to extend to other places. We also have the challenge of susceptible chickens. So we, um, we get non-immune or, or non-susceptible chickens to the virus, and then we inoculate the exudates from the sinus or the trachea, and then we will observe the reaction, kind of like sentinel bears. And also other methods of diagnostics are the detection of antibodies, in which is the agar gel immune infusion, the virus neutralization, the immunofluorescence, and I want to um, tell a little bit more about the ELISA. So for the ELISA, I think is um, in the U.S. the ELISAs are only used to determine the immune status of the flocks. So this is good, a good tool because it's easy to test a large numbers of serum and is semi, is semi automatic. I mean, no automatization. Uh, of this test. So it's very easy to perform. Now, it's important to have a baseline of titers and for each company. These um, numbers that I, I are showing here are from BioCheck. So we have um, the different type of vaccines and what titers are expected with this specific kit of BioCheck. So we, we use a TCO vaccine, the tissue culture, the titer after six weeks of age, it should be between 1,000 and 3,000, and the percentage of positives should be less than 30%. Now, we understand that it will be a suspected infection if we see more than 50% positive, and of course, um, higher titers than this. With the CEO, different case, the titers go to 1,000 to 6,000. This is the percentage of positives, but unfortunately, when we have sick bears, there is no differentiation between um, both of them, infection or the vaccine, because this is a live vaccine, chicken embryo origin. And we have our vectors uh, that has the titers between 500 and 3,000, the percentage of positive between 40 and, and 100, and then the suspect infection will be um, greater than 4,000. So this is in the case of broiler breeders and layers. These are the reference for broilers. Now, I also would like to, this is also from BioCheck. So this is a study in, in which they measure the single HBT, ILT vector vaccine. And then those are the reference titers that, that come out with this. Now, the, the BioCheck is a specific for the glycoprotein I that is in this vector vaccine. So this kit is no, um, good to use for the other um, vaccines because it doesn't have that glycoprotein specific in the kit. Here is a study done by ID Bed and that it was presented at the AAAP meeting on August 2nd, just two weeks ago. So this study was, um, this kit was developed by this company specific with the, against the glycoprotein D that are in these vector vaccines. So at this moment, the vector vaccine that has um, was created with glycoprotein D in the ILT part is the vector vaccine HBT, IBD, and ILT. So this kit was presented and is specific for this glycoprotein. So in the experiment, and they, uh, or they validated this study looking at the, every titer that is less than 611 is negative, and titer greater than 611 is positive. So they sample bears at 20, uh, 28 days of age, day 42, day 63, and day 98. And then here we can see a baseline of titers of bears with any challenge, so only the vaccine. So we have titers from 4,000 going day 63, almost 14,000, day 98, 12,000. So this kit was developed only for the glycoprotein 
D. So it's a very good tool to measure this new innovation of vaccine against the HBT, IBD, ILT. Now we are going to talk about the prevention and control. And of course, we have to start talking about biosecurity. Biosecurity is essential to prevent the, the outbreak with infectious laryngotracheitis. The biosecurity, when we create guidelines, it should be checking periodically, meaning every month, every two months, we have to ensure that what we are saying in the protocol or the guidelines for biosecurity is being followed up. Uh, following, uh, following steps for biosecurity should be taken, and some of them are like keep all visitors to size to a minimum, provide full protective clothing, including boots, overalls, and hats, provide hand washing facilities, ensure all equipment, including x-rays and trolleys, are clean and disinfected prior to being brought on site, ensure all vehicles visiting sites are clean, maintain regular diagnostics and monitoring services through the clinical and post-mortem examination, Always pay attention when you are mixing bears, like mixing vaccinated bears or recovery bears with susceptible bears. So if we are going to mix in breeding stock, we have to have a complete history of the vaccination of those bears that we are mixing. Also, uh, contaminated premises should be cleaned and disinfected and left vacant for 14 to 21 days. There is also a recommendation of gold standard is for leave the premises vacant for four to six weeks, but that's not practical in most situations. Additional measures of biosecurity are presented here also, the early detention, swift and proper storage of mortality, managing the litter, composting, and doing the withdrawal from the litter also, disinfection of the equipment, and don't forget to heat the house around 100 um, hours in order to inactivate the virus. And of course, uh, we talked about this before, increase of downtime. This is a, an example that I bring from my experience in Del Marva with broilers. So when we have uh, cases of ILT, the first time we do the diagnosis, at the first moment, the first two or three positive cases that are here in green. So we will kind of like, like drive around um, a zone area, five miles green around those cases. And then those farms that are around those positive green cases will be vaccinated. So in this picture are the ones that are in red. So uh, looking at that, we will have increment the biosecurity, we will uh, heat trim in those houses, and we will let uh, increase the downtime for around three weeks. And then we extend it also to 10 miles radio around that, and then it will be no serving of any bears, no broiler litter spread or stayed in the house, and of course the recommendations at least two weeks of downtime if it's possible. For uh, another um, thing that I want to mention for prevention and control is the control by vaccination, you know, very important. So we have two types of um, vaccines. So one is the modified live virus vaccines that uh, among of them are the chicken embryo origin and the tissue culture origin. And we have also the vector vaccines. So what we have in vector vaccines are the recombinant Falpax vector, um, ILT, we have the herpes virus vector vaccine, HBT, ILT. And of course, the new um, um, innovation in which we have two inserts. So we have the HBT, IBD, ILT, and of course, it could be other inserts. All of these vaccines also are available, but we, you have to check with your local authorities to make sure they are allowed in your region. So another, some region doesn't allow the CEO and, and et cetera. So it always should be uh, consulted with your local authorities. This is an example here of um, 
of the recommendations on vaccination done by Dr. Mari Carmen Garcia also, that is a um, reference in, in the um, in US for ILT. So in countries where the CEO, TCO, and recombinant vaccines are allowed, we will recommend one day of age, subcutaneous recombinant vaccines, so an HBT that we can do it in, at the hatchery, in ovo or subcutaneous. Also, 8 to 12 weeks of age, an eye drop of TCO or CO by drinking water. In countries where the TCO and only recombinant vaccines are permitted, with the same one day of age, subcutaneous recombinant vaccines, 6 to 8 weeks of age, we can use the recombinant, fall pulse virus ILT in the wind wind, or, or we can also 12 weeks of age, an eye drop of TCO. And in countries where only recombinant vaccines are permitted, one day of age, the HBT vaccine, six to 10 weeks of age, the fall pulse LT viruses. Again, we, I, I wanna be clear that we need to check with our local authorities before we start this type of vaccinations. This is an example also that I like, like to uh, present it to you today because is is showing the difference between the fall pax virus vaccine when it's applied. You know, this is in ovo, subcutaneous. Here we have our positive control, negative control, and the HBT vector vaccines. So, and these are are measuring the clinical signs. So, as we can see here, this is our positive control. You know, it has the major clinical signs, and then we look that the HBT the vectors that are the vector vaccines that are using the HBT are sharing less clinical signs, so better than the fallpox vaccine. And here the viral genome. Lo this was clinical signs. Here is the the amount of virus in the trachea. So again, they were very close, but even with that, the A the vector HBT ILT show a significant difference among of these three. The positive control and the fall pox um, vector vaccines. And of course, significant difference to the negative verse. And um, this is also a statement at the Diseases of Poultry 14th edition 2020, in which is a statement that the currently the layers and the breeders are vaccinated as subcutaneously at one day of age or in ovo. This is in the, in the US and then it has been shown an improvement on the broiler's performance, reduce clinical signs, and prevent mortality. So, and also is well known that when we are using the, the vector vaccines at the hatchery, is buffering also the results of the, the live vaccine, that in this case is the chicken embryo origin, that is well known to have some reactions when it's not well applied and handled. So with that, I have to talk about the recombinant um, LT vaccines because it's the latest innovation. So like I mentioned before, bivalent and trivalent. So the HBT vectors, they don't transmit from bear to bear. They are species specific. They don't revert to virulence, don't induce any vaccine reaction, and of course, and then don't cause performance penalty. The Innovo or the Hatch vaccination exclude the need for field vaccination. But of course, in high challenge regions, we combine the HBT vector vaccine with TCO or CO, and that's a common practice also. But however, and I wanna uh, mention this very careful also, in the past, when we have, um, uh, we couldn't, we know that there is a lot of the studies in which we could not combine the HBT vector vaccine, let's say HBT ILT with HBT IBD, because it is the, those studies have shown that the, com the combination reduced the efficacy of both vaccines. So always when we go to a, a certain time of the year, before we have to pick, do I do my, my do I vaccinate my bears for ILT or do I do with the vector for IBD? But uh, but now so we have a vaccine that is called the HBT-IBD-ILT, 
and the design is showing, you know, is Maddox disease, IBD against classic and standard strain, as well as the ILT. So at this moment, since uh, 2020, we have in one vaccine, uh, a vaccine that is protected against three diseases that are, like I say, Marex, infectious borsa disease, and ILT. This uh, is a unique vector vaccine with a single promoter that for two disease inserts, and also is an strong immune foundation because we know that when the bears are affected by ILT, it will be, they go to immunosuppression. That's why they always are presented with other diseases like mycoplasma and Newcastle, kind of like what I alluded in my first slides. So also this vaccine will simplify vaccination program from field only to hatchery, will improve animal welfare because we have fewer vaccine applications. And at this moment, we have around 30 million vaccine, commercial layers vaccinated with the HBT, IBD, ILT in the US. And with that, I, um, I will be happy to entertain any questions and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Osorio, for a very thorough discussion. At this point, we will have a 15-minute break. Um, see you later for, uh, for the rest of the presentations.
Welcome again, everyone, for the continuation of our breakout session. Let's start right away with our third paper. The third paper to be presented for this afternoon's layer session is a description of disease sequelae of a confirmed case of avian hepatitis E virus infection in layers. Our speaker earned his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from the University of the Philippines in Diliman in 1988, and he specializes in poultry medicine and management. He was awarded the Outstanding Veterinarian in Farm Animal Practice for 2021 by the Philippine Medical Veterinary Medical Association. The Veterinary Practitioner Association of the Philippines also chose him to be the awardee for the Outstanding Poultry Practitioner in 2014. He has more than three decades of experience as a practicing farm veterinarian and has served in the corporate agribusiness sector taking on technical service management and marketing positions in various multinational companies like Cobb Asia Pacific, Hipra Philippines, and others. At present, he is a consultant and a lecturer of various local and multinational companies. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the finest consultants from PCPP, please welcome Dr. Raul Elias C. Lopez. Brother Aro, to everybody, good morning, uh, good day to all. Uh, today, I have decided to give a talk about a new disease that was recently confirmed to be present in our poultry industry in the Philippines. Uh, it is my intention to talk about the disease so that everybody will have an idea or at least have the uh, information of this particular disease that could be affecting your poultry flocks or your poultry operations. The title of my presentation is a description of the disease sequelae of a confirmed case of avian hepatitis E virus infection in layers. I talk about this uh, confirmed case because this was a case from a production company where it has been in operation in the 1980s. It has layer breeders, they have their own hatchery, they have their own feed mill, and they have four multiple age pullet farms. And uh, they have one a multi-age layer farm uh, as a, uh, where all the pullets uh, come uh, to be transferred. Okay. This uh, layer breeder uh, and the one pullet farm are in the same area and also a piggery had been in the same area but it has since closed due to the, even, uh, due to the African swine fever disease. When I started to uh, help this uh, company, uh, in uh, 2020, the overall production results were very low and it has been very low for many, many years. And there have been present uh, many uh, diseases present in the farm and there was severe uh, undernutrition, especially with uh, vitamin nutrition. Of course, uh, when, you look at, when I looked at the production system, I also found out that there was improper management of the rearing and the laying uh, farms. So there was a lot of adjustments that were done uh, uh, to improve the production results. And we had introduced a new brooding system. We organized the placements, the density of birds, feed and water complement. And we revised the vaccination program. We introduced water line cleaning and proper chlorination. And then we programmed preventive medicines in the grow out. We uh, took a look at the nutrition and we reformulated uh, the feed uh, and we reformulated vitamin mineral premixes. We remodeled the diet to focus on delivery of sure available nutrients. And of course, we improved the care and management of birds. And lastly, very important, I had, uh, re I had to re-educate you know, the, the owners and the farm people. So as a result, we had uh, better pullet results, as you can see in this result, that uh, our depletion rate had reduced from about 15% down to less than 3% by the time the birds were transferred in 16 weeks. And uh, 
body weights, uh, we had a uniformity of about 90, 90 more than 90 percent no? uh, at transfer. So very good results, very happy about it. But and then uh, as a result of that, we saw we saw improved layer production results, but uh, there had been disease incidents no? uh, at the start of production up to peak production. Uh, you can take a look at the left uh, graph. This was the production results of the previous uh, uh, performances, but with improvements, you can see the production results had become better. In uh, March you know, 2021, uh, there was a disease no, in newly transferred layers, and they had observed uh, symptoms of the pallor of the comb. Uh, which was uh, observed starting 17 weeks and the uh, 26 weeks when I was uh, visiting the flock I saw pale birds and there was uh, elevated mortality you know? uh, commonly uh, I would say the mortality would have been normal if they were at five to six birds per day and I should look at the graph here you see that mortality at certain days were more than five to six birds you know? Uh, mild respiratory disease was observed and peak production uh, was not realized. As you can take a look in this uh, production results, you see the dark blue line uh, compared to the uh, light blue, uh, which is a standard of target production hen day. You see that the hen days were not able to reach the targeted or the expected hen day, you know, despite very good production in the growing system and uniformity of birds. When I looked at the birds, there were very poor comb development at 26 weeks, as you see in the photo. And uh, you see birds had had pallor, no? they're pale, paler than others. And again, you see another photo where you see uh, affected birds were also had a uh, poorly developed comb and had pale of the pallor of the comb. No? And then you see uh, emaciation of these birds, as you can see in this cage where you see uh, visibly this uh, affected bird had uh, you know, really smaller than the rest of the birds and had the symptoms of uh, pale comb. And then later on you see weakness and then later on you see that these birds die and they're just trampled on by the other birds you know, in the cage. Okay, so this is uh, what you see in the layer houses. On necropsy, when we open the birds, we open basically those that were visibly affected, small, emaciated birds with pale comb, undeveloped comb. And you see uh, in this first uh, necropsy, we saw a uh, you know, fairly common liver, but already there were some signs of enlarged spleen, and then there was an ovarian infection. Uh, also, we saw uh, enlargement of the sequel tonsils. The other birds that were open again showed the uh, normal liver, and then you saw some uh, uh, mucodexidate in the trachea. As you, the birds had uh, mild respiratory disease. But uh, other birds that were open showed, uh, you know, enlarged pale liver with uh, diffuse necrotic areas. No? And you have also enlarged uh, spleen. So the initial diagnosis during the time based on necropsy and clinical signs had been that because the mortality had not been so high, this was attributed to possibly the respiratory infection and we had uh, implemented antibiotic uh, treatment. You know? And we tried to increase uh, the uh, feed consumption to try to get the birds to get a higher hand day. The very next week, uh, I again visited the same uh, flocks and you see uh, on necropsy again, pale birds and the necropsy results show now more and more birds with uh, enlarged liver, which are pale and had diffuse hemorrhages, uh, necrotic areas, sorry, diffuse necrotic areas and you had the viral infection and then you see uh, other signs that may be secondary to the problem. Again, as you open more birds, you see again that enlarged liver with the diffuse necrotic areas and enlarged uh, uh, spleen. 
And in this case, you see also uh, necrotic widespread hemorrhages in the duodenum. Again, the uh, ovar ovaries had been infected and had been affected with this problem. On the second, on the very next uh, week again, uh, then we, uh, uh, no, sorry, during this uh, visit, the, uh, we, I talked about uh, the handy performance had improved, but adjustment to feed formulation uh, had to be done, had to be improved to improve eggshell quality. No? But in terms of the disease, uh, the house 12 and 13 continued to have pale birds and had uh, opened uh, a lot of these uh, pale birds and had liver lesions and hemorrhages in the duodenum. So in this case, I already suspected possibly adenovirus infection, but would need the uh, lab confirmation. On the very next week, again, I revisited this farm. Again, you see birds that look very normal, uh, except that there are some birds, uh, very few birds that had liver lesions. And uh, in this case, uh, I said, I opened the birds, some had uh, tumors in the liver, and some also had enlarged livers also, which were, again, could be suspect for Marek's disease and for uh, polyadenovirus. So uh, during that visit, I uh, summarized that uh, we had about 2% depletion rate in uh, house 12 and 13, and then 75% had of this uh, Depletion had been due to culling, no? because the farm decided to cull all the pale and emaciated birds. On necropsy, we see obdat infection, air sac infection, liver disease, and gel infection of the internal organs. Okay, so samples had been taken, and this was uh, sent to the lab for adenovirus uh, uh, confirmation. No? And uh, we sent this, the uh, organ samples, particularly to the UPLB Newton Agham lab. So this is the summary you know, of the disease that was present in the farm and the necropsy results. You know. So we had pale birds, we have enlarged friable liver, we have enlarged spleen, we had the chromatic uh, hemorrhages in the adenum, and I had suspected this for adenovirus infection. And all these samples were sent to the UPLB Newton Agraham lab. And uh, as a summary of the case, the flocks had been affected with uh, respiratory disease from one to three weeks after transfer from two different pullet farms. The flock transferred in January at 16 weeks. And uh, Newcastle Disease Challenge vaccination done ahead of serology results at 21 weeks. Uh, pneumovirus challenge titers and the IB were, are within expected levels. So we took uh, blood samples and we saw that uh, ND and IB were not uh, part of the uh, uh, disease uh, present, but we had uh, pneumovirus challenge titers. But we have been vaccinating. It doesn't, uh, we can, uh, we, we're not uh, sure if the pneumovirus had been the one causing the respiratory disease. No? Antibiotic uh, medications have been given with uh, partial improvement and the depletion was about 2% per month, mostly due to culling of pale and machated birds. Okay. Again, the, uh, the mortalities uh, showed uh, that enlarged liver with diffuse uh, necrotic areas and enlarged spleen. So the samples taken to the lab had been liver samples, uh, stomach and intestines, and uh, sometimes we sent a whole bird samples no, with a white nodule in the liver. The results show that uh, these birds had been Marx disease positive, but uh, fall adenovirus negative. So it was not yet, uh, the results had not been conclusive because uh, still the Marx disease as a, uh, in terms of the disease pattern does not, uh, you know, indicate the disease in the farm. You know? So this could have been a Marsh disease infection or Marsh disease uh, mis-vaccination uh, in some cases. Uh, but there could have been uh, more diseases that had been affecting the flock. So in October, we had further tests done on those samples. And this time, 
we tested for avian hepatitis E, which were found now to be positive no? uh, for the helicase gene and for the avian hepatitis E ORF2 capsid gene. No? So two PCR results of these samples show that these uh, samples had been uh, positive for avian hepatitis E virus. Okay. Actions that they've done were to prevent uh, secondary infection, we increase vitamin inclusion in feed just to increase uh, the immunity status of those birds. We focus on ensuring birds are healthy in the rearing farm and we focus on feeding at transfer at peak production so that these birds are kept healthy so they can fight off the disease naturally. And we try to reduce microbial complications coming from the water by taking care of water line cleanliness and water quality. So at the end, we had uh, a lot of things that we tried to uh, you know, mitigate the effects of the disease. And at 80 weeks, house 11 had uh, its eggs for hen house was at 362 eggs, which was uh, quite good as against a target of more than 350 eggs at 80 weeks. But the sad thing is that the depletion rate was at 27%. No? And uh, we were targeting to have at least no, just a maximum of 15%. In terms of the cost to produce, we had uh, been feeding these birds 149 grams of feed per egg, no, commutative. For house 12, or sorry, for house 11, the daily mortality had been uh, quite high during the early laying period. For house 12, flock performance at 80 weeks, the eggs per hen house was at 346 eggs. Depletion again was very high at 26%. And feed per egg community was 147 grams. And then here in house 12, you can see that the mortalities had been peaking during uh, peak production and at mid age. For house 13, the eggs per hen house uh, performance at 80 weeks was 342 eggs. And again, depletion was very high at 28% and 148 grams feed per egg cumulative. So it's not a bad performance in terms of egg production, but in terms of depletion rate and feed uh, per egg, then this uh, flock was not that profitable. And uh, the mortality rate at, 13, at the house 13 showed that the mortalities were peaking during uh, a peak egg production to mid-age. So, just for everybody to understand, you know, as a review, what is uh, avian hepatitis C e virus? This uh, virus causes uh, three you know, uh, described diseases. First is the big liver and spleen virus. The second one is the hepatitis splenomegaly syndrome. And the third one is the hepatic rupture hemorrhage hemorrhage syndrome. So these are, I guess for a lot of us, this is uh, quite new and I think uh, very important for us to understand the, what this disease is all about. Uh, for everybody's information, the avian hepatitis C virus has now been detected in chickens in a number of countries, which include the US, Hungary, Canada, Australia, China, Korea, Poland, Israel, Austria, Austria, Chechia, and Taiwan. So we are going to be on the list of these uh, countries which had already uh, confirmed or identified the virus to be affecting their poultry industry. In terms of the big liver spleen virus or big liver spleen disease, no? uh, the clinical symptoms uh, very much as we have seen in our case, you have pallor of comb, anorexia, drowsiness, you have pasty dropping, soiling of the vent feathers, you know, and hands are found dead usually with a good body condition. You see enlarged and mottled livers and spleen and ovaries are regressing, very much as we have seen in our case. And this disease uh, showed uh, a drop in egg production and a mortality rate increase you know, of just a uh, Small increase in elevation only, not a spiking disease. So, um, more or less, 
I guess this is the type of uh, disease that we have experienced in this farm, big liver and spleen virus disease. But there are other uh, diseases that have been described, uh, which is the hepatitis splenom splenomegaly syndrome, which uh, has uh, symptoms of ovarian degeneration. You have the abdominal redness and liver is amyloid or fatty. No? Uh, and again, this has uh, problems in uh, egg production in both breeders and layers. And the third uh, disease is the hepatic rupture hemorrhagic syndrome. And the symptoms include uh, the presence of the male of the pale crest of the, of the comb. And you had uh, doiling or soiling of the vent feathers. No? The, this uh, disease uh, can happen as early as brooding, but uh, very common at start of lay and at peak of lay. In terms of the history of the avian hepatitis C virus, this was first characterized in chickens in Australia in the 1980s and was found in a commercial broiler breeder plot. And the confirmation of this disease was in the 1990s when uh, PCR was used to uh, detect the virus, to describe the virus. Uh, this virus was also described in British Columbia in Canada in 1991 and in the United States in 1997. In terms of poultry disease, this can be considered as something quite new, no? not yet well understood. In terms of the avian hepatitis uh, description, no? the disease, no? the replication of the virus in the pathogen pathogenesis are still poorly understood no? in that uh, our uh, poultry scientists are still studying our, this uh, virus to have a better understanding of what it is, how we can control it. But the virus has been found to be affecting a broad uh, range of animals. No? And there is a potential threat for a zoonotic uh, disease no? to be transmitted to humans. So that is the worry. In terms of the classification of the avian hepatitis C virus, it is a, an ortho virus B uh, species of the family Hepeviridae. And uh, there are four species no, in this uh, genus ortho virus. And our uh, avian hepatitis C virus belongs to the ortho virus B, which includes uh, viruses from chickens and wild birds. No? But the other species uh, are found in a, you know, a wide range of, uh, of animals, including orthohepivirus A in humans. In terms of transmission, uh, there's a fecal oral uh, transmission, and uh, this is commonly transmitted by contaminated feed and water. Okay, uh, experiment, experiments have shown possible uh, nasal and oral route uh, transmission and vertical uh, transmission studies have been done. A uh, lot of information, but not very conclusive. In terms of disease control and prevention for vaccines, there are none yet, uh, possibly because uh, it has not reached uh, proportions that are going to be, uh, you know, will uh, create a uh, huge uh, effect you know, in terms of, uh, you know, causing a lot of production problems. You know. In terms of disinfectants, it is sensitive to iodine disinfectants and is also sensitive to high temperature. In terms of uh, laboratory techniques, you know, uh, we are able now to detect the virus by reverse transcriptase PCR for virus detection and we have also some companies have developed uh, ELISA tests for this uh, virus. So as it is a disease, no, fairly new, not yet uh, fully understood, especially in our country, we need to be able to learn more about this disease and about how this disease is present in our industry. How is it spread out no, in our different islands? So we can try to understand this better by 
doing a serological survey using ELISA. Also, you can submit organ samples for PCR testing and sequencing. And then, very importantly, is we try to be more aware no, of the presence of disease just by uh, looking at the symptoms of uh, pale pallor of comb no, at the start of lay. So, uh, to end my presentation, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Dennis O'Malley of the UPLB Agham Lab uh, because he's, uh, uh, he was able to bring in the PCR primers for avian hepatitis C virus so that uh, we can perform all these uh, tests to confirm the disease. So thank you very much for your time. I hope uh, you can participate in uh, uh, being able to understand the presence of disease in our country and can contribute so we, everybody can benefit from the information. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you very much, Dr. Raul, for the excellent presentation. Moving on to our fourth paper. The fourth paper to be presented for this afternoon's layer session is Use of Mobile Applications in Egg Production a new era in on-farm data utilization. Our fourth speaker for this afternoon session specializes in poultry. He graduated from University of Zaragoza, Spain, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, and attained his Advanced Veterinary Studies Certificate from Ecole Nationale Veterinaire Nantes, Nantes, France. He held various positions such as veterinarian for Granja Cantos Blanco and Dagu, and Production Manager for Aviagen Spain. He is now the Global Veterinary Specialist for H&N International. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Fernando Carasquer Puyal. Hi there. This is Fernando Carasquer from HL International. This is my pleasure to be today with you here, for sure. I will strongly prefer to be with you in person in beautiful Philippine Islands. Well, it's not possible, but we can take profit of uh, you know this wonderful technology to uh, anyway make this presentation. And my topic for today is the use of mobile applications in egg production and the new era in on farming data utilization that this is uh, bringing. So let's start putting the focus what it should be, okay? Because these data, are, these apps are very interesting, but are mostly about data and how we are using them in modern life, okay? We need to put focus on data and that's what we are going to do during this presentation. So how important are data for the egg laying industry. Well, I think that data use is a main pillar of success in poultry industry, and especially in egg poultry industry. From the very beginning, from the these pioneers in genetics one century ago, from to the, I would say, all farm managers that are using data for taking the right decisions at the right time, data, play a crucial role in our industry. So we are an industry that is really data attached. But data collection is really a hard job, you know well, okay? We are spending a lot of energy and time in, for example, widening our birds or counting eggs or widening these eggs. And later on, we need to put all the data together. And this is really a hard job. And this is a hard job, mostly because the data are coming from different sources and in different formats. You know, in a normal operation, we have data coming from the green farms, from the production farms, from the grading station, and if we are speaking about breeder operations, 
we also need to add, for example, uh, the hatchery or others. Okay. And also, these data are coming in very different formats. We can receive data in paper or maybe in a PDF file or maybe, you know, in an Excel. And also, we are storing this data sometimes in paper, other times in Excel that can have also different formats. So when we want to put this all together, this is really a mess. As consequence, well, we don't have always time enough for taking all the value from this data. Okay, not always a good analysis is done from this collected collected data, and that's a pity because, uh, for at least for myself, I have always the idea that when we can, you know, have more from this data that we have collected. But let's be clear, at this moment, we are living a revolution in the data use, okay? You know that we are not longer living in the industrial age, not even in the nuclear age, but in the information age, okay? What is moving the world right now is the use of this data and, you know, taking the maximal profit from the use of all this data that we are producing all of us in so many parts of the world. And this is not for poultry, okay? That's a global trend. So let me explain a little about this revolution in the use of data that we are living. First, we are living a revolution in devices, okay? In the left hand, you can see the first computer I have access in my whole life, okay? It was in 1991, it was a big computer, okay? And in the right hand, you can see the uh, smartphone that I use it at the moment for personal purposes, okay? Not for professional purposes, but for personal purposes. Can we do, you know, any kind of comparison between the two devices? In the weight of the device, I would say in the type of screen, or in how we enter the data in these different devices, or the software that they're using, or in the data processing capacity of these two devices? I don't think so. Well, I'm pretty sure that if I have the, the opportunity of show this smartphone that I have now to myself in 1991, probably I, my, myself in 1991 will say that this is alien technology, okay? So far and so fast we have gone in the last years. Also, we have a revolution in the availability of the data, okay? I know that most of Filipinos, you are, you know, uh, fanatics of basketball. Me too. I used to play basketball when I was a teenager. So probably you have followed the um, last NBA finals, and probably you know who won these finals. But do you know how many points scored this player in the game three of the finals? Well. Probably not by memory, but I'm pretty sure that if you take your smartphone from your pocket, just a few clicks, you are able to get this information in, in a very fast way. So data, even the, I would say, the most unexpected data are fully available for us at these times. Also, we are living a revolution in the interactivity of data. Okay, the screen you can see, you know, just a few apps that I use in my normal life, okay? Apps for driving, apps for sharing pictures, apps for texting with my friends, app for, I don't know, for the bank, for losing weight. Well, there is so many of them. The point is, yes, I'm introducing data, or I'm entering data in these um, in these uh, apps, but these apps are also communicating with me. <laughs> Believe me, when I get up or in the day, I have I would say no handled off by dozens of uh, notifications from these different apps 
giving me information based in the information I have entered to these apps. For example, if I'm following someone in one so, uh, social media, if his person, this person is posting, well, I have a notification telling me this person has posted a new post. So, data in more life are alive. But my next point is, if because I say that there are apps for everything, or oh, this is you know for when I say everything is everything from banking to cooking, okay, for everything. But are we using this technology in a poultry industry? Do we have a gap in technology? Because this is technology that is available for, I would say, mostly everything in life. But and for poultry protection. Okay. Well, I think that we can agree in the characteristics that these as for layers should have. Okay. I have uh, written uh, some of them in this slide. Okay. User friendly, online. Easy, to, easy data collection, uh, laying hands and uh, build flocks all included in these programs. Okay, it's the same that we have for other apps, for other things that we do in our run run life. But the point is, does it exist any app like this at this moment? My, quest, my answer is yes. And I was, and not just one, but many of them. Okay, at this moment, you can download to your phone uh, different apps that can help you uh, in your egg production um, operations. Uh, there is many, there is some of them which uh, are coming from uh, genetic companies, others are coming from software companies, others are coming from, uh, I would say, um, companies attached to different um, governmental uh, um, Governmental uh, institutions, and um, there are some of them that you need to pay for using them. There are others which license is for free. There are others having a, a, a type, a very precise type of features. There are others that have other features. So my answer is not just yes, but my answer is yes. And you can choose because at the moment you have different options in the market. So, okay, it exists. <laughs> Probably that's uh, interesting, but why is this interesting? Okay, let me speak a little about the features that make these apps interesting for the egg laying industry. First, and that's very important, they are helping us in data collection. They make an easy data collection. First, because all of these uh, apps have a user-friendly environment, okay? And many of them have data, data entering tools. That means that uh, these apps are designed for making the life of the farm workers easier, okay? Um, to be used in a very intuitive way, okay? And probably, and I, that I'm pretty sure, most of your farm workers are already, they would say, uh, using these apps for their, farm, uh, for their normal life. So what I want to say is at this moment, mostly all the population know how to work with apps because they are using them, okay? So these programs are very easy to use and very easy, I would say, to implement in an operation. As they are following the same structure that we are having for other apps or other things, uh, I would say, in social media or banking or other uh, purpose. Second point is that they record directly to detail data at database. Okay, so if you don't want, there's no need of paper copy longer. And as I say, say all data are stored in, a, in the cloud. Okay, that can be a controversial point. It's 
especially for the I would say safety of the data. Okay, say so, okay, I have my data in the cloud, but are these data safe? Well, here I have two points. Okay, first, well, also the data in paper copy are having a risk of being destroyed or lost. So, uh, my point is, yes, for uh, data in the cloud, it can be a risk, but also for paper data in paper copy, there is a risk, okay, of being lost or destroyed. But normally all these apps, you know, have a good server, so data are safe, and most of them give you the, the, kind of the possibility of uh, easy data export. What it means? It means that you can easily uh, export the data from the cloud to your devices, and you can store a copy of this data in digital, or in your computer, or in, in, a, uh, or in, in another kind of uh, data storage. So you will keep your data in the cloud, but also in your devices. So I mean, I would say, and using you know, human uh, less room or space that you will need for uh, storing this data in paper copy. So if you are having, I would say, if you are working correctly with data and you are having you know, um, security, uh, hope to see that. Let's do this three seconds. If you are having correct, uh, I would say, um, okay, I will start with, uh, from the beginning of this uh, of this uh, slide. Okay. Yes, it's okay. You can keep going. Yeah. Okay. Another point is uh, these apps record directly to digital database all all uh, data. So if you don't need it, no need of paper copy. Okay, because all your data, as I say, are directly stored in the cloud. I know this can be a controversial point, okay? Especially from the point of view of uh, data security. Well, first point I have to say is normally this data in the cloud are you know well maintained and you should not have any problem. But in any case, these apps are allowing you to uh, easy data export. So you can easily download this data from the cloud to your devices and keep a security copy in your computer or in another uh, physical data storage um, system. So if you are having, or if you are dealing correctly with your data security, there is not an extra risk in having data like that, okay? And this, I will say, capacity of uh, exporting data give you another, I would say, uh, another uh, uh, positive point, okay? That is that you can use this export data for other devices or for other, I would say, softwares. I know, for example, that most of you have um, uh, uh, Excel files that you are using in routing, for controlling your flocks or for following your flocks. Well, you can use these apps for just collecting the data and keeping them in the cloud. And then you can download the data and in an easy way, introduce the, or enter this data in your um, 
Excel file and keep working with your Excel file. So not because you're using these apps, you need to stop to use your uh, Excel files that you are using at the moment or other systems that you are using at the moment. Another point or another feature that is interesting is that most of uh, these programs are available for the world production cycle. So these apps are covering the breeding period, the commercial layers, the breeders, and some of them even the hatcheries, okay? And that's very nice because it gives you the possibility of having directing uh, or directions between the different uh, parts of the cycle or sending, sending and sharing information from the different parts of the cycle. And that's, that's giving us, you know, uh, new opportunities for having, you know, better um, data analysis. Another feature, and I have to say that's my favorite one, is these apps are strongly improving teamwork. Why? Because the flock or the flock data can be shared between one or more users. What that means? that you can give access to your data to your different collaborators. For example, if you have um, one person uh, or a vet or, or a nutritionist that is giving you advice, you can share your data, I would say, in real time with, with him or with her uh, by using these apps. Okay, there's no more need of being, sent, being all the time sending a, you know, Excel files or uh, having a course about if, what is the production level of the flocks or whatever, because they can enter directly to the to your data by their phone. Okay. Another important point is that these apps or most of these apps are giving different roles for different type of users. So, I mean, depending on you can depending on how you want to work, you can give different, I would say, privileges to the different users for having access to a part of the data or the world data or some, or to have to do some actions or not to have access to this action. So I would say is these programs or these apps are very well structured for uh, giving you the opportunity of improving teamwork. And from my point of view, that's very interesting. Also, most of these uh, apps have a, a feature of task manager, okay? They have easy to follow uh, from task list, task list, sorry. So that's very nice because, you know, in a farm we have many things to do and it's very nice to have a task list and, and having a, a easy way of following up this uh, task and if you have it done or not. That includes also the vaccine programs. Uh, some of these apps give you the opportunity to enter your vaccine programs into the system and later you can follow the vaccine program and their uh, administration through the, um, the app. And also lighting programs, which is also a very important point for, for us uh, in poultry production, and also can be entered in the program and can be, can be followed up in the program. Uh, as I said before, in modern life, data should be alive. And this is the case of some of these uh, apps, okay? They are sending you early warnings. How? through notifications, okay? Notification, if you have a missing task, you have forgotten, for example, waiting the process this week, okay? Notifications, if the data are out of the scope, for example, if you have very low uh, uh, body weight in a flock, you will receive a notification saying, hey, have you realized that your the weight of your birth was very low? And some of them also have a kind of artificial intelligence trying to uh, uh, give you more information in why this problem is happening and how to solve it, okay? For example, from some of these apps, if you have a low body weight 
and the, the last week weeks you have a high temperature will uh, send you a notification saying you have a low weight in your birds and probably this is related to the high temperatures that we had in the farm in the in the last weeks okay still human factor is the base of poultry industry but these kinds of i would say help or are i would say very welcome finally these programs give you an easy access to data and graph okay you will have your data with you all the time in your pocket in your uh, smartphone but also you will be able to produce graphs in a very easy way and that's nice okay because sometimes for explaining things to farmers or to other people it's a very good tool to can produce very uh, graph very quickly okay not to have uh, you know the not to have the, the the need of going back to the office produce this graph in the, in Excel or in other programs and then send back to the farmers. No, no, with this, you can do your graph, I would say, directly. And also you can do tailor my graph, okay, because, you know, we are not all uh, doing the things in the same way. Um, there is people that is more, I would say, based in one um, type of data and others prefer to be based in other type of data. So you can do tailor my graph. Okay. For sure, you can compare with the standards uh, of your uh, of your breed. I think this is also a very nice tool, and this can be can make our life also very uh, easy. Okay. What is coming? Okay. When we have all this data in the globe, we can start to use big data. Okay. We can start mean the data. And trying to do comparisons or trying to uh, make uh, you know some uh, investigations to know how these data are related. Okay, if the for example the body weight at week eight is related with the number of effects that our blocks are producing, or if this particular uh, program of light is giving us four or five uh, x more uh, in the flocks uh, that are receiving this particular lighting program or if this vaccine uh, when it's used at this age is giving us less mortality i don't know the, the 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 possibilities of this are huge okay uh, we know that other industries are already using this and they have you know a strong advantage of using this big data because right now we have a capacity of data processing that was not uh, for everyone uh, and was not a, a normal thing okay and right now with the computers we can do it easily but for sure we need all the data collected in, a, in the globe or in, in the same uh, system so that's also coming soon and i think that's also a big opportunity for us so let's go for my final words okay first <laughs> These apps for laying hands are not science fiction. They are reality. Okay, so it's not one thing that is coming in the in the future. They are, we have already here these uh, apps. Okay, and they are free to use. Uh, let's let's uh, restart because I, I I have lost the I have another point here and. Uh, 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 Okay, let's go for my final words. First point is this house for laying, uh, laying hands farms are not science fiction. They are a reality, okay? At the moment you have, I would say more than one available. All of them are, you know, ready to be used. So they are a good opportunity for you uh, for uh, starting to use them, okay? Why they are a good opportunity? Because they can strongly improve the way we collect, we process, we monitor, and we share data in the laying poultry industry. And 
I will, you know, uh, highlight the way we collect and we share data because these two points are critical for us. Okay, the, as I say, data collection is a hard job and it can it can make our life easier. And sharing is so important. Okay, the way we are sharing data and that we are providing data to different I would say actors that we have in our industry, you know, the farm managers, the production managers, the owners, and I would say the, the advisors that we have in the company is critical for the success of our companies. My next uh, final word is exactly about that, okay? That these programs enable a new way of communication between teams in poultry related industry. That is critical, I would say, communication is always critical in any uh, kind of industry, okay? And that's also critical for us. So if we can improve um, communication through these apps and communication by using data, that will be a very strong point of improvement for all companies. These apps, are not just for data collection, okay? They have more utilities, as I said before, okay? Uh, that can make your life easier, okay? Having, you know, uh, these uh, early warnings, having this uh, task list, having this uh, possibility of producing uh, graphs in a very easy way, that's great, okay? And can save time and effort for from your teams, effort that can be used in other things that you know are also important. So don't think that don't think on these apps just as, as a data uh, just for data collection, but think that they have many more utilities. And I'm pretty sure that in the future they will have even more. And my last final word is not a conclusion, but more an advice from myself that this become an early adopter of these apps. Or at least try to work with them, or at least download some of them in the in your uh, phone, and try to work with them. Because this technology is really, so you can, <laughs> you can, for now, take profit of it. So at least, from my point of view, it's a very important thing that you have the knowledge of. Uh, it or at least you have tried to work with. So that was uh, all from me. Thank you for your attention. Uh, for sure, I'm ready for every question you have in the, after the presentation. It was my pleasure to be with you. Uh, ready for your for your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Puyal. Actually, I can relate to what Dr. Puyal said. When I was in, uh, when I was still studying, I was thinking of data science, mobile application, tablet, or computer applications as science fiction. But today, we are seeing them coming into reality. So that uh, all of these technologies are very interesting. So moving on to our fifth paper. Our fifth paper to be presented for this afternoon's uh, layer session is Practical Tips in Hitting Your Targets at Week 6 and 12. Easy as 1, 2, 3. Our speaker earned his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine at the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, Laguna. He worked as Poultry Technical Specialist and Poultry Product Manager in Sharing Plow Animal Health and InterVet. Ladies and gentlemen, the general manager of Okie Dog Poultry Farm and the founder of the Chicken Doctors Veterinary Consultancy, please welcome Dr. Christopher S. Patawaran. Welcome to Layer Management 101. I am uh, Dr. Christopher Patawaran, founder of the Chicken Doctors. And our topic for today is practical tips in hitting your targets at week 6 and 12, easy as 1, 2, 3. So, 
Optimum performances of layer birds will always depend on good rearing management. We all know that management plays a big role in our success in our farming. And hitting these parameters at week 6 and 12 would spell success and failure in terms of when the birds would lay their eggs. This topic will give you management tips, our farm experiences in hitting these parameters, management tips, some numbers that you can uh, remember, and some numbers that you should not forget. Start right, finish strong. So it means that when we talk about layers, we talk about uh, starting right with the grow outs, with the pullet rearing management. And if you hit these numbers prior to caging, the layers will lay eggs in no time. So we have a saying that goes, a wise man learns from others' mistake. A fool learns from his own. So it is self-explanatory that with these discussions and seminars that you are attending, you will now have to learn from the others' mistakes and avoid these mistakes because it's very costly and eventually you will be more successful in your layer farming business. So why week 6 and why week 12? So let's discuss why these uh, ages are very important. Week 6 dictates the maximum number of eggs that the individual bird can produce. It means that when these birds reach their numbers, their standard weight and good um, uniformity at week 6, then eventually these birds will have a maximum number of eggs that they can produce throughout their lifetime. It is in the manuals. Uh, you can always look at the manuals or the breed manuals and you can uh, basically look at the performances of these birds and it, they would emphasize the importance of week 6 uh, because at week 6 it also includes the proper development of the tissues and internal organs especially the immune system of the birds as you can see the the, the vaccination programs from week uh, 1 to 6 almost weekly we give them vaccinations so we almost weekly we handle the birds it's very stressful and so hitting the numbers or the parameters at week 6 is very difficult. So we, this uh, seminar will give you some tips in order to hit those numbers. Target weights, especially for this uh, 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 specific breed of bird, is around 419 to 441 grams. And depending on the breed, of course, as we uh, take care of uh, large breeds, they have higher numbers. The number should also be always at 85% uniformity. It means that you are doing well and you can must maintain 85% uniformity all throughout your rearing period. Sometimes farmers would, would say that it's better to hit more than the, the, the target. But then again, this is not inside the uniformity. It is not within the uniformity. So therefore, it should be right body weight at the right age. For week 12, it is where the body frame of the bird is developed. You want bigger eggs, you achieve the number or the standard body weight at week 12. This uh, dictates the size of the egg and uh, avoids prolapse cases when the birds are already in lay. Remember when you have problems about prolapse cases that you thought about cannibalism? Sometimes, uh, you have mortalities of around 20 to 30 birds per day for about a population of 10,000 birds, especially for the big breeds. It is because you don't hit the standard numbers at week 12. Because after week 12, what is already developed are the fats. So the, later on with the discussion, we can see some of the uh, topics or uh, segment wherein we're going to discuss how to feed or how to manipulate the nutrition of these birds in order for us to hit the week 12 numbers. So this table showed, uh, shows us a 20 year of production enhancement for a specific breed of bird. This is from 1984 to 2004 and we have been discussing this for the past uh, three decades already. And when you look at the numbers, are you hitting these standard numbers even 20 years ago? Remember, the, bird, the breeds that we have right now are entirely different from what we are uh, 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 producing uh, years ago. And if you can see the numbers, it is still very hard to hit 50% at 20 weeks. 
it is still hard for us to hit 1.1 or 1.2 uh, kilos of uh, a body weight for 17 week old birds so these things are very difficult so in order for you to to look at your performances you look at this table and see where am i right now common mistakes overloading when success when business is good you add more birds uh, late expansions because you you try to bring in those chicks prior to finishing your layer houses or growing houses low equipment bird uh, ratio so it means that you have so many birds but then again you forgot to buy the necessary waterers the feeders no body weight monitoring no, no classification during grow poor feed shifting i mean there is a, a, a guide in, in the feeding uh, management of these uh, specific birds or specific breeds. But then those guides are only followed whenever the birds hit those numbers, when, whenever the bird hits their, their body weights. Lighting programs. Sometimes we do not uh, remove the light. We don't have time for them to sleep. So lighting programs are very important in achieving your body weight and especially uniformity look at this picture what can you say about it it is very crowded but then again when you look at the birds they're quite a, a good uniformity but when you go around it you will see some uh, birds that are really small and this building was loaded with 40,000 but the, the capacity of the building is only around 32,000 at one square foot per bird uh, space ratio. So this one is overloaded. Uh, the building is actually not really prepared for it. So they tried to um, build another one for expansion, but it did not push through for, for the birds when, when they are already scheduled for transfer. Uh, so poor planning resulting to inadequate flow of transfer expansion. For example, they did not load specifically for this month and they loaded uh, chicks probably two months after so that's where the problem comes in because as the birds in the laying house gets older they want to call them out because they're no longer profitable then they wanted to bring in more chicks in order to cover that uh, deficit so when you look at these birds you see a very small bird here this is a result of overcrowding it is a uh, runt bird so when we open up these birds uh, it is very thin, very emaciated. The bird is relatively weak. Mostly when I have these problems, I suspect mycoplasma. But then again, when you look at the internal uh, organs of the birds, especially the air sacs and the lung area, they are quite clear. So the birds are, are doing good in terms of respiratory health. But then again, because of overcrowding, we have this specific result. The only problem that we saw is proventriculitis. Um, this is brought about by these small birds eating those fine particles because, they're, because of course, the bigger birds will always uh, 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 push out or back, backs out the, uh, the, the smaller ones. So the, the smaller birds would be left with the fine particles wherein they, they, those are the only feed available for them. So eventually you see signs of proventriculitis and you see thin-walled intestines as shown in this picture. And when opening up this uh, uh, proventriculus, you see slight hemorrhages uh, on the proventricular surface and apparent uh, gizzard erosions because of hypersecretions of hydrochloric acid of the inflamed proventriculus. So the, this one, for, for every overcrowding that we, we do, we always see the signs of uh, birds uh, having uh, these uh, proventriculitis and thin-walled intestines. So these thin-walled intestines would show you that the enteric part of the birds are not uh, well uh, covered in terms of health because um, of the diet that they get because they don't have enough of those grains, of those fiber, um, whenever these birds would eat for, with the big ones. So it is very important for you to segregate the smaller ones. Common mistakes, of course, um, 
primarily low ratio of water or feeder for every bird. Um, late expansions, uh, we always see this in, in, in the farms that from the second week up to four weeks, they tend to late expand because of the weather patterns. So sometimes it's cold, sometimes it rains. So they try to, to um, not expand the birds and uh, to bring in uh, or extend the heater. So that's where, there where prob the problem comes in. So at six weeks, you should at, at least achieve the one square foot per, per bird space requirement. The expansion does not only cover space requirement, but also increasing the number of feeders and waters. Because of the birds grow bigger, they require more access to feeders and waters. It also improves the ventilation, so access is the key. So this is a basic example of a standard uh, space and bird to, what, to ratio requirements. Um, as you can see with the numbers, 18 birds per square meter or 0.6 square foot per bird at three weeks. But when you go to six weeks, you gradually increase it to one square foot per bird. And the numbers of feeders and waters or the galleries are here. Also, don't forget that whenever you expand and you use other sources of, uh, of um, um, source of waterers, like for example, coming from bell drinker, uh, coming from galleries to bell drinker, then you should not immediately remove the galloners so they can have at least access to these uh, uh, waters for probably around one to two weeks. Other problems is uh, proper brooding. Most importantly, because uh, it is where your success would also lie in your growing period. Um, always use your sixth sense, which is the common sense. And uh, always make sure that your role you should remember that your role is you're the hen now, you're the mother hen, because these chicks uh, rely uh, on you in terms of food, in terms of warmth, in terms of space. So make sure that you do your job. Reality check sometimes that uh, the day old pullets are not always of high quality and of acceptable weights. Of course, especially when there is a great demand for uh, DOPs. DOPs coming in are already tired, especially if the, the farm is really far. If they uh, travel more than three hours, so they're already tired, exhausted from the trip. And you miss the 8 to 12 hour window of achieving the best integri intestinal integrity. What do I mean by 8 to 12 hour window? Let us discuss that uh, with the succeeding slide. And always assume that the chicks coming in are positive with mycoplasma and salmonella. Just always assume. To make sure that the antibiotic and the other supplements that you give to the chicks have a um, um, claim against mycoplasma and salmonella. Okay? So, immediate access to feed and water is very important because it enhances the development of intestinal villi and absorption of yolk. Wherein the yolk is the colostrum of these uh, chicks. They get their energy from there, they get their protection from there, their antibodies from there. So make sure that uh, the birds have uh, immediate access to feeds and water upon arrival. So this study is done by Dr. Rafael Monleon, uh, wherein he showed to us uh, a comparison wherein there is ac no access to feeds, immediate access to feeds. There is access to feeds at eight hours later, then there is immediate access to feeds upon arrival. So when you look at these, uh, these chicks, when you look at those uh, 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 intestinal length, uh, so the, 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 the below uh, intestine here that indicated do feed, um, it, the intestinal villi or intestinal length is actually short compared to the feed available eight hours after. Okay, so, and compared also to the um, uh, chick wherein there is immediate access to feed and water, look at the length of the intestines compared to the other two. We have better intestines for the chick who had immediate access to feed and water. Dr. Monleon also uh, made this under uh, electron microscope to make sure that he has seen the um, uh, intestinal villi, where intestinal villi are actually the ones that absorb 
the nutrients from the feed. And when you look at this one, uh, the two-day-old chicks that are fed immediately have better uh, in intestinal villi. There is no space in between, especially compared to this one, wherein these are the held chicks. Uh, there's these, they are not fed uh, prior to uh, uh, upon arrival. Okay. Let me also discuss with you guys um, the the feeding and nutrition um, table, wherein you should uh, base your feeding management or or feed rations. So this graph above here showed us that the the, the development of tissues and organs of different ages. Uh, when you look at the blue, it is for protein. So it means that from day one to week twelve, they need a lot of protein. So make sure that the um, that the formulation has enough lysine, methionine, and the necessary necessary amino acids or the protein sources that they need. And when you look at the bone structure of the birds, wherein they are developed, most are developed from week one to week eight. That is where you should also make sure that you have enough supplementations of um, minerals and calcium during this uh, period of the birds. And when you look at the fat development, it is actually wherein the birds are already at their 12th week onwards. So no matter how you would feed the birds, when they don't hit the 12 weeks, then you are only uh, producing fat for them. No, you do not do the, the, the skeletal body frame. When you look at the bone uh, development, it is only up to around 10 to 11 weeks where you can at least um, catch up on, on, the, on the frame size of the birds. But when the birds reach around 12 weeks, the game is over. So even if you feed them starter diet or if you even add lysine or methionine, you are only adding... Um, uh, muscle mass and if you increase the number of feeds you are just adding uh, fat so these birds when you don't hit the numbers at 12 weeks eventually you will have birds uh, laying bigger eggs in, in, in later on and they will be prolapse birds okay lighting program so it is very important for us to follow this lighting program as you can see as as, uh, the, as they grow older, you increase the number of dark hours. And you should follow that when birds reach around 30 days of age, up to 120 days of age, they should only have at least 12 hours of lighting. Why? Because birds need also to sleep. This is where your uniformity plays a bigger uh, role and the lighting program uh, contributes a lot in, in, in achieving that proper uniformity. For example, if you don't put out the light for 24 hours, what will happen? If you don't put out the light in 24 hours, the birds will eat. The birds will eat again and again and again. And your FCR would uh, basically increase. And, and the birds that really eat a lot would be the, the bigger ones. And so there will be a bigger discrepancy or or um, uh, wherein the, the, bird, the bigger birds will be grow bigger and the smaller birds will be left out. So when, when you do dark periods, the birds will sleep for 12 hours and eventually when you feed them, they will eat a lot and they will have a full crop. Every one of them will have a full crop. This will also dictate uh, when the birds would already hit their, their prelay period, you need the full crop bird. It is the crop capacity that would also dictate success for the initial uh, stage of uh, lay of these birds. So when you do dark hours for these birds, you are also increasing the crop capacity, you are improving your uniformity, and with that in mind, you should look at your water to feeder ratio. That's why overcrowding is not allowed. Uh, so make sure that you hit these numbers, all right? And of course, when uh, they achieve at, uh, at day 120 onwards, you start increasing light hours because you're trying to stimulate their reproductive system for laying purposes. All right? 
All right. So what are the signs that tells you you are doing it right or you did it right with your growing, growing uh, management? Chicks usually molt on the 15th week. Uh, this is what we call the last molt prior to lay. So when, the, when you see birds molting on the 15th week, this is when you add more uh, vitamins or amino acids, specifically methionine, to help in the molting process. Because the feather is made up of keratin, and keratin is from uh, methionine. So they, relatively, they need a spike, a little spike on the methionine source. So when birds molt on the 15th week, I like molting these birds, or I like seeing molted birds on the 15th week because it means that I have achieved very good body weight and very good uniformity. So when, when birds are well fed from uh, up to 12th to 13th week, then you will see a more extensive molting or change of plumage. You will see that everywhere in your, in your building house. You see a lot of uh, shed uh, uh, feathers. The absence of molting at this age means poor weight development or poor uniformity. Let me show you one example of picture wherein these birds are 15 week old birds. And you see a lot of uh, plumage uh, on the ground. And you see on the left side of this uh, picture are birds now having those very red comb. Uh, so they are actually now going to produce eggs for you. So I would like to see this molting, this a lot, this lot of feathers on the ground during the 15th week. Okay. So pullets at 15 weeks showed early signs of sexual maturity. This is taken from the same building showing uh, those uh, molted feathers. All right. So a reflection on the topic, performance is never an accident. It is always the result of intelligent effort. So thank you very much, guys, for listening. Um, any questions, I would like to entertain. And uh, have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Patawaran. That's the end of our five presentations for our layer and broiler breeder session. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed with the open forum or the question and answer session. May we call and screen our five speakers? Uh, Dr. John Lemuel V. De La Cruz, Dr. Claudia Osorio, Dr. Raul Elias C. Lopez, Dr. Fernando Carasquer Puyal, and Dr. Christopher S. Patawaran. Okay, good afternoon, uh, doctors. Thank you again for the awesome presentation. Okay, so we will now proceed with the Q&A session. We will be asking one speaker at a time. And I guess we will start with uh, the first uh, paper that presented, that was presented. Uh, Dr. Lemuel de la Cruz. Okay. Dr. Lemuel, we know that uh, some of the questions on the Q&A box were already answered by uh, you. But uh, if you may, uh, we will still uh, read the questions again live for you to answer them live also for the benefit of the rest of the audience. Is it okay? Okay. Dr. Lemuel, the first question is, what fat score should we achieve prior to the onset of lay? And what specific age of the pullet we need to conduct fat scoring? Yes, Doc, I can hear you, Paul.
Well, what's the importance of uh, uh, fat stores in egg production? Excellent. Doctor, uh, thank you, Dr. Limuel. Since uh, Dr. Claudia Osorio and uh, doc Dr. Raul were not here, uh, we will just proceed with a question for Dr. Puyal. Okay, Dr. Puyal, your first question is, what if the main struggles of farm owners and managers is knowing the amount of feeds that they should be feeding their birds. Do you think we can also develop a mobile application wherein it can compute the amount of feeds that we should be giving our birds if we just put in or supplement vital data like body weight, fleshing score, specifications of feeds, and temperature and humidity? I agree. Thank you, Dr. Puyal. Our next question is for Dr. Chris Patawaran. Okay, Doc, you're so near yet so far. <laughs> okay, Doc, your question is, we have different layer breeds here in the Philippines. Is the paper you presented today applicable to all layer breeds? Or are there different management practices and feeding regimentation for each breed? So, Doc, uh, just a follow-up question. Um, how can we know the best breed of layers to choose? Mm 
So, Doc, it will depend on the target market and the location. All right. Going back to Dr. John Lumel de la Cruz, your next question is, you mentioned about the negative effects of early light stimulation. Are there also negative effects of light stimulation? Uh, I will repeat the question, I'm sorry. You mentioned about the negative effects of early light stimulation. Are there also negative effects of late light stimulation? An additional question, does color of the light bulb matters? Uh, the next question, Doc, is the color of the light bulb matters. Thank you very much, Doc. That was very clear and concise. Okay, let's go to the question for Dr. Puyal. Dr. Puyal, in the age of data science, how does the producer can safeguard its information from any hacking incidents? Thank you very much, Dr. Poyal. Okay. Our next question is for Dr. Chris Patawaran again. We know that different sources of feeds have their own specification on feed formulation. Having said that, how can we know the volume of feeds that we should be giving our flock? Do we have basis on the amount of energy that we should be giving on a daily basis?
Okay. Thank you very much, Doc Chris. I think that the most uh, common problem in feeding for uh, layers and broiler breeders, breeders is that when the farmers already have a feed regimentation, they, uh, they take for granted the amount of energy or the calories of the feeds that they are using. So that's where, uh, what's very important to uh, establish first is know the calories and the specification of the feeds that you are using. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Chris. Okay, going back to Dr. Limuel. Doc, um, just a short question. What is the best way to treat cannibalism during the rearing period? So there are different uh, reasons for uh, having um, um, cannibalism in our flock. So it's very important to know the main cause of the problem so that we can treat it. Okay, so are there any questions for Dr. Poyal? So if not, let's um, have the last question. I think this will be the uh, our last question for our speakers. Okay. Sige. Dr. Chris, pwede na ata tayo magtagalog. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Dr. Chris, uh, I think anyway this will be the last question. Um, Dr. Chris, what are your parameters in assessing good quality RTLs? Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Chris. That was very clear and concise. All right, so that concludes our Q&A session. Thank you again to our five speakers for sharing your valuable knowledge to everyone today. And now we're moving on to the awarding of Certificate of Appreciation. The Philippine College of Poultry Practitioners, Incorporated, presents this Certificate of Appreciation to, John, to Dr. John Lemuel V. De La Cruz for having served as a resource speaker during the 2022 PCPP Poultry School Online 
with the theme Strengthening the Poultry Industry Towards Sustainable Recovery via digital platform on September 8 and 9, 2022. Given this 8th day of September 2022, signed Maria Cynthia R. de la Cruz, Secretary Dr. Esmeraldo B. San Pedro, President and Dr. Generoso Rene M. Romo, Chairman of PCP uh, Poultry School Online 2022. Same citation was given to Dr. Claudia R. Osorio. All right. Same citation given to Dr. Raul Elias C. Lopez. Same citation given to Dr. Fernando C. Poyal. And same citation given to Dr. Christopher S. Patawaran. Everyone, that concludes our afternoon layer and broiler breeder breakout session. Thank you to all our presenters today and thank you everyone for attending this session. Be before we end, just a reminder uh, to take the quiz. Don't forget to take the quiz and answer the evaluation form to complete your eligibility, eligibility for the CP points. And again, we appreciate you being here, continuously learning and working together for strengthening the poultry industry towards sustainable recovery. And guys, the broiler session is still ongoing, so if you want to um, catch the presentations, you may transfer to the other breakout room. And also, later, we will be having a raffle. Okay? Hinihintay ng lahat, raffle. So, but guys, you have to go back to the plenary session to catch that. And of course, uh, mangyayari po yan after the broiler uh, breakout session. So, yeah, enjoy the rest of, your, of the presentation and thank you very much. But at this point, may, we would like to thank our sponsors. Boringer Ingelheim, Platinum Sponsors. Adiseo. AB Vista. US Soy. DSM, JA Farms Asia Pacific Incorporated, IFF, Cobb Ventures Philippines Incorporated, Nezus and Levisel, Seva, Visham Nutrition and Beyond, EW Nutrition, Zoetis, SVI, Spearvet Incorporated, Sistamas International Inc., Nutribiz Corporation, Allmix, Ivonic, Kipra Philippines, Yunako Sarimanok Poultry Feeds, Eco Animal Health, Senmidis, Cargill Philippines, RNSV Corporation, MSD Animal Health. For our silver sponsors, Refamed, Arca Galeon, Ivialis, Fibro Animal Health Philippines Incorporated, Big Dutchman, Heritage Veterinary Corporation, Fresh Options Meat Shop. InnoVet AgriVentures Inc. 